All right, everybody. Welcome to the Municipal Housing Agency Governing Board meeting uh, for August 8th. Let's call our meeting to order and I will ask the clerk to please take roll of our board. County. Here. Bozen. Here. Voss. Here. Shoemaker. Here. Westergaard. Here. Mandelbaum. Here. Gatto. Here. We have a quorum. Our second item is approving the agenda as presented and or as amended. Move. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Item three is approving the submittal of the Des Moines Municipal Housing Agency's 2022 Section 8 Management Assessment Program, the CMAP, certification to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Board Communication Number 22-351. Move. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, I'll ask everybody to vote. And aha. Uh -huh. Mm, Seven yes. Works, My button is working today. <laughs> All right. Um, that completes. We had a short agenda. Could we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, we sit adjourned. The city council meeting will start in 13 minutes. That was quick. Yeah. Okay, so
Welcome everybody to our Des Moines City Council meeting again for August 8th. Uh, before we take roll call, I uh, was just reminded, I welcome back to our clerks who are now sitting out front again. So uh, we get to see their bright, shiny faces and uh, we can communicate directly. So Laura, thank you for getting uh, everything fixed and my button fixed over here so I can vote on the screen. Uh, Let's call our meeting to order and I'll ask the clerk to please take roll. County? Here. Bozen? Here. Voss? Here. Shoemaker? Here. Westergaard? Here. Mandelbaum? Here. Gatto? Here. We have a quorum. All right, item two is approving the agenda as presented and or as amended. I will quickly say that uh, are the regular items uh, for this evening, item 52B was added. It's a final consideration of an ordinance above. The waiver is requested by the city manager and again require, requires six votes. Item 53 is corrected. There's a legal uh, description that was changed in item 53A also was corrected. Again, a legal description change. Other than that, it's as printed. Could Move approval. It's been moved. I'll second. And seconded. Ask everybody to please vote. Seven, yes. All right, item three is approving the consent agenda tonight. Those are items three through 50. Uh, and for those of you who are um, noting on this, item five, I vote no. Item 20, uh, Councilmember Shoemaker votes no. Item 32, Councilmember Westergaard wishes to speak. Item 38, Councilmember Gatto wishes to speak. And item 48B and 48C, Councilmember Shoemaker votes no. Is there anything else? Move approval. All right, it's been moved. I'll second. And seconded. Ask everyone to vote. Seven, yes. All right. This evening again, uh, we are hearing items. We will move quickly. That's 51 is where it starts. As a reminder, you know, for the zoning items uh, this evening, which are 53 and 54, we will hear from the parties in interest first. Uh, if any wish to speak, and then the general public, the parties in interest or the people within 250 feet or the applicant themselves. Uh, after all the parties in interest have commented, we will open it up to any member of the general public who would like to speak to aid in recognizing the parties in interest uh, who may speak in the zoning items. I'll ask that everyone else not step up uh, to the to the microphone unless they are that applicant or they have lived uh, within 250 feet and received that notice. Anyone who approaches the mic uh, before their time will be compared with a mailing list and if not on the list will be considered disruptive and will not be recognized for the remainder of the meeting and will be required to leave the building. So please, I ask, wait until I call in the general public for the zoning items or you won't be um, called on the remainder of the meeting if uh, you're not on that. After all the parties in interest have been called upon, the general public will be called upon for their germane comments, yet not to exceed one minute per person to a maximum of seven minutes unless the hearing is ended sooner for a failure to make germane comments or no one wishes to speak. Now for other hearings this evening, any interested person may make germane comments at not to exceed one minute per person to a maximum of five minutes per hearing, unless the hearing is ended sooner for a failure again to make the germane comments. So let's go ahead and get started. Item 51. Item 51 is on a vacation of City Alley right of way located north of and adjoining 2513 High Street and a conveyance to Robert Fuller for $75. A is the first consideration of this ordinance. 
B is the final consideration of the ordinance above and the waivers requested by Robert Fuller and requires six votes. Again, uh, we'll open up the general public and ask if anyone would like to speak on this um, vacation of the alley. <coughs> Seeing none. Happy to move item 51, uh, 51A and 51B. All right. 51, 51A and 51B have been moved. Ask everyone to vote. Is there a second? Yes, yeah, Connie seconded. Connie seconded. Item 52, which is on the vacation of excess east west alley right of way uh, located south of East Railroad Avenue, north of Harriet Street, and east of Southeast 15th Street. A is the first consideration of the ordinance above. B is the final consideration of the ordinance above. The waiver is requested by our city manager and requires six votes. Again, we'll ask, uh, are there any germane comments from the general public regarding this vacation of this excess east-west alley? I see none, Your Honor. I'll move 52A and B. All right. 52A and B have been moved. Is there a second? Second. We've got a second. Ask everyone to vote. Item 53. Um, this is on a request from uh, R. Michael Knapp. Um, we don't have the. We, we do now. We do now? Okay. I retract what I just said. <laughs> so it's on the uh, request from R. Michael Knapp, 2001 Revocable Trust, Ellen Patricia Knapp, 2001 Revocable Trust, Ellen P. Knapp Trust, the R. Michael Knapp Trust, the owners for the property located. In the vicinity of Southwest 56th Street, Southwest McKinley Avenue, Southwest Watrous Avenue to amend the plan DSM creating our tomorrow plan to revise the future land use classification from low density residential, business park and development control zone to development control zone and low density residential and rezone the property from P2 Public Civic Institutional District EX mixed use district and N2B neighborhood district to a limited N2B neighborhood district to allow the development of the property for one household residential uses. A is the first consideration of the ordinance above. Again, this is a rezoning, and we'll ask are there any parties in interest present? Uh, including the applicant. Is the applicant here? Would you like to speak? Paul Clausen, Civil Engineering Consultants, 2486th Street, Urbandale, Iowa. Um, we're proposing uh, to rezone the 75.7 .7 acres to uh, N2B. Um, that's the same as adjacent uh, landowners just north of this site. Um, the large scale development plan shows 62 single family lots. Again, similar to the adjacent property. Um, we just submitted signed and notarized uh, agreement to the zoning conditions required for the rezoning. And um, we request that you approve this request tonight, or the first reading, and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Anybody? All right, stay available in case something pops up. Okay. Are there any other individuals in interest uh, who received a note within, who live within 250 feet of this property around. Seeing none, um, we'll open it up and see if there are any germane comments from the general public. Again, would anybody like to speak regarding this rezoning? Seeing none, uh, do we have a motion? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I will move item 53, uh, 53A, and then pursuant to rule 42A, I will move to waive the second and third readings. Second. All right, been moved and seconded. 
Seven, yes. All right, item 54, done a request from 4021 Properties, LLC. Jenny Smith is the officer. For property located at 4019 and 4021 Ingersoll Avenue to amend the plan DSM creating our tomorrow plan to revise the future land use classification from medium density residential to community mixed use and to rezone the property from NX2 neighborhood mixed district to RX2 mixed use district to allow for a two story building addition for expansion of office use. This was continued from the July 18th council meeting. A is the first consideration of the ordinance above and B is the final consideration of the ordinance above the waivers requested by the applicant and requires six votes. So we'll ask um, again, we have a rezoning. Are there any parties in interest present? The applicant. Is the applicant present? Hello, I'm Anna Squire with MA Architecture here on behalf of Jenny Smith um, with 4021 Properties LLC. As you described, we're asking to rezone the property from NX2 to RX2. We have received and notarized the condition with this rezoning that we follow Preservation Brief 14 and work with um, city staff to comply with design requirements associated with that. So we ask that you consider and approve of the rezoning and we're happy to answer any questions. Anybody have anything? Hearing none, we thank you, but stay available in case uh, something comes up. We'll ask now if there's any parties in interest here uh, who live within 250 feet of this uh, property being asked to be rezoned. Anyone party in interest within that 250 feet that received the notice? Seeing none. Uh, let's open it up and are there are any members of the general public who would like to speak on this rezoning. Uh, what up council? My name is Chad Kroger. This is my colleague JT. Uh, so we heard that Iowa will be voting for a bill that could potentially prevent citizens from being able to bear arms. And we come from far away, a place called SoCal, where that right is protected. And it's a tradition that has brought great joy. Okay, and there so we say, excuse me, uh, this is not relevant to this uh, item. This item is a rezoning. Um, uh, we saw that the thing we wanted to talk about wasn't on the agenda, so we were hoping we could interject quickly and succinctly with our case for why it's important to bear arms in America. Well, because we've been working on our pipes for like years and we feel like that should be protected. If you put sleeves on us, there yeah, could be well, dire consequences. We appreciate your showing up, but you are, uh, this is not relevant to this issue that is under consideration. We're talking about a rezoning, so you are out of order and we'll ask you to please sit down. Well, I, I just hope that our pipes are recognized by the council. Okay, uh, we'd like you to please leave. All right, I'll just leave you with this. What would happen if Thor was forced to wear sleeves? Thank you. We'd ask you to please leave. All right, uh, Mr. Mayor, seeing yes. no other for, for germane public comments, I will move item 54, 54A, and 54B. I'll second it. Seven, yes. All right, that takes us back um, to item 32. Item 32, Councilmember Westergaard asked to speak Thank on you. the conveyance of the excess city-owned property located west of and adjoining 
1626 Mr. Dixon Mayor, Street. If I could interject just for a moment. While our friends from Southern California are still filming, I just want to point out the double standard. While that was very funny, um, the, we do have a double standard that when other people come up and speak out of order, they aren't treated with the politeness that they were treated here today. And I just think that needs to be pointed out. It needs to be acknowledged that when people come up here and talk about issues that are important in our community that we can do something about, instead we sick the police on them. I just want that to be acknowledged while, we, while this is still on everyone's minds. To Liberty Holdings Inc. for $25,875. Uh, the hearing is being scheduled for 8-22 of 22. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted, I know that we're just setting the date of hearing for this, but there wasn't a lot of information included with our packet other than they're asking to, for us, they, we, they would like to vacate the right of way so it will take care of some of their compliance issues. My concern with this is, is I don't want us to vote to approve anything with Liberty Holdings until we can get them to proactively work with the neighborhood. If you're familiar with this, this is just north of Washington Avenue in the, in the industrial business park, but right across the street, we have Martin Luther King Jr. Neighborhood Association, and those are all single family homes. I have been to the homes, I have been invited by the people who live there to come and see the cement dust, they're having trouble breathing, they can't go outside. I would really like us to see what we can do. I had contacted the city, the city said, there isn't anything we can do. You have to contact the county. So I t contacted the county. I did receive an email back saying they had gone out and they had talked to Liberty, um, to Liberty Holdings, and they would try to do what they could do to get the dust down. But I think I, I owe it to those that I represent that we really work on coming up with a solution here. So I just hope there can be some work done between now and the, when it lands on our agenda for our hearing. So I, I will vote. Um, I will vote on this to, to allow the hearing, but I would really like city staff to be directed to be in contact with me and see what we can do to make it better for the neighbors. Yes, please. Yes, before I will. the hearing on August. Yes, before the hearing, maybe they should come out and you know we can tour the sites. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with this with this excess land. If it brings it that much closer to Washington, I don't want that because they're already having trouble. I think most of you, the at large and the mayor, if you've been to the Martin Luther King <coughs> Jr. neighborhoods, this is brought up at almost every single meeting. So I will move item 32. Second. Seven, yes. All right. Uh, Council Member Gatto uh, has asked to uh, pull item 38, which is the preliminary terms of an urban renewal development agreement with Union at uh, River's Edge LP, the Annex Group, for the new construction of a 216-unit uh, multifamily apartment project at 214 Jackson Avenue. Again, Council Communication Number 22-357. Council Member Gatto. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just um, a couple things I, I, I'd like to point out. Um, and I've had a discussion with Scott and some council members. Um, this item is asking for significant resources from the city. Um, it's adjacent to Columbus McKinley Park, uh, which I still represent until January 1. Um, I was never notified about 216 unit family development going in. Um, neither was the neighborhood association that it's adjacent to. 
I don't even know if the schools were notified that we're going to put that big of a housing unit in. This is, uh, this is some prime real estate that I feel that we're investing a ton of money into river trails, water trails, down the raccoon, that this is right on the water. It could be a mixed use um, with housing above it, with commercial, but this is the first of probably many that we're going to see that want, that, want this land, um, that maybe won't ask for s so much significant resources. I mean, when we look at the tax abatement that we're going to give them, plus the TIF, um, let's see, over 10 years, the estimated net taxes that we're going to receive is less than a million dollars on a $56 million project. Um, to me, I think we can do better. This is an out-of-town group. It's not someone local that we can have a multiplier if we're going to invest in someone local that we're going to get the turnaround that we would get from a local developer. Not to say that there hasn't been any interest. Um, the, the property directly to the west, uh, the owner definitely wants to sell and wants out, so that would clear the entire riverbank for development. I, I just, uh, the process is flawed, and, and I've talked to Scott. Um, yes, I, I'm sure the at-large council members, the ward council member was contacted, but to leave an entire neighborhood group out of any type of discussion, even just up front, I mean, when we built BC Flats and Jackson Crossing and, and Eagle View, it wasn't in Pioneer Park Neighborhood Association. It wasn't in even the Columbus Park neighborhood, but they were all included in the conversation at the very beginning, which is a way that worked out fine because we didn't get emails from the Neighborhood Association. We didn't, they were all for it. It's a great development, and I'm not saying that this is going to be a terrible development or, or we don't need to invest. I think that we can do better, and I, and I, think, that, uh, I, I think there's an opportunity that we're going to miss out by just settling for something that it's the first to come. That, that's all really I had to say. I'm not going to support it because it, it needs to have a discussion with the neighborhood, and, and it seems to me like that the decision's already made that they're not gonna have any discussion with it, nor did the ward councilman reach out to his future neighborhood association and let them know about it. Um, I get a call from them on Friday or Thursday when the agenda come out, wondering what this is all about. I had no idea. It was not on the June um, portion that Aaron sends out. I, did, I went back and looked at my email. I didn't see that on there, um, so. I, I know that it was said that it was on these things, and it, it, it's, it's flawed, the process. We need to do better. And so um, I guess that's all I need to say. But, well, if the city manager wants to respond, otherwise I, I'm happy to say so a few I words. Do, I don't know if you want to respond or whether you have some staff that maybe has reviewed this and would it's, like to it's, give us I mean, there's really no response. I mean, the decision's been made. I mean, I, I'm not looking for a response. I'm, I'm not going to be supportive. It would be nice if we would continue it, have a discussion with the Neighborhood Association, let them know what we're going to do instead of moving, you know, moving so quickly. Um, you know, that... that I think, that's, I think that's what Mr. Post and the entire Neighborhood Association would like to see. Yeah. So obviously we're always open to have a conversation about changing the process and I, I think we can obviously bring that forward if, if there are several council members that want to have this as a scheduled strategic item even. But there is no uh, required uh, zoning changes and that's when you would typically trigger through our process the neighborhood association notices and have those conversations it's 216 units mr manager Understood. this isn't a this isn't a 10 or a 12 uh uh a, you know th th this isn't a small uh development it's a 56 million dollar development that's going to get tax abatement and tiff for the next 20 years 20 years hope everybody <laughs> understands that 
Josh? But so I do support this project. Um, you know, one of the things that we have done with our zoning uh, is we have identified places where projects of this magnitude are appropriate to build. Uh, and that is the, the point of the zoning discussion that we had to make it easier. You know, one of the one of the issues that is frequently raised is we make it too hard to develop in Des Moines. Uh, and I think it's positive that we are drawing this type of interest uh, from groups that have successfully developed in communities all around our country. Uh, and one of the changes that we made with our zoning was to identify areas where uh, the scope of development was appropriate. Uh, and uh, that is what we have done in this case. Uh, you know, I do think there are parts of our uh, development agreement that, that certainly merit uh, merit discussion from a policy perspective. You know, one of the things that this is all project generated uh, increment, <laughs> so this is not getting any incentives above and above and beyond what will be generated by the project. They are contributing to our to our tax base, uh, and they will be housing folks in our community. There is a definite need for projects like this. It fits. Within the area, there are lots of other multifamily projects in the adjacent parcels. Uh, so uh, getting a almost $60 million investment at this parcel, I think, is a positive project, and I'm excited to see it move forward. Uh, I'm happy to discuss how we use our incentive structure. A, and, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, if we want to talk about how we engage ward council members and broader discussions, I certainly think one of the principles, any time that, that we go above and beyond project-generated incentives, uh, that may be an appropriate time to trigger broader council involvement. Uh, but if you're within project-generated uh, incentives and you're consistent with previous policies, I think this was appropriate. The other thing I would point out, these are preliminary terms, so there's still time for conversation before the terms are finalized. Um, but I think this is how our process is set up. I think it is appropriate, and I am happy to move item 38 at this time. Um, I'll second that. I am also in support of this project. Um, what we're talking about is uh, 216, is that correct? 216 units of affordable housing at 60% AMI. Um, in an area that already has similar density. Uh, we're not adding new density to the area uh, at the final point of this project. Um, this would constitute one third of the, um, of the existing units in the adjacent areas. So it's not like we're putting in a, a huge new project that doesn't belong there, it absolutely fits in. Um, I would also add on that I think it's a wonderful thing to put next to our water trails. The point of them is, is for use, our, our uh, trails along along the river. The point is, is use. And we're going to have a lot more residents who are going to be able to use um, those trails that we put by the river. And so I think it's going to be an appropriate location. Yeah, I, I didn't say it wasn't going to be used. I said there could be a much better use as far as a mixed use development. If you, if I, if you misunderstood me, that's, that, that was my statement. It would be better if there was a mixed use, if there was a, a housing above and there was commercial below. That was my statement. I understand you better now. Okay. Can I just ask, can we just have a clarification of how does this compare to the other projects that we have given incentives to? And I did ask a question about the schools, and they were going to look into the numbers that they thought, they looked at the history of, for these type of apartments, how many, usually it's 50% of the building is usually filled with kids. So, uh, and I think that's a conversation that we should always have with the school district when you're building this larger unit that could have a lot of kids, is there accessibility? Uh, it's a little ad more advantageous there because you do have McKinley, you have Walnut, you have downtown, so you do have probably a little more choice than in some neighborhoods. Uh, but that will continue to be a concern that I think we need to be aware of. Where's Walnut at? The Walnut Street building. <laughs> it's uh, 9th or 10th? Yeah, where it's been. It's part of the administrative office, but they made a school out of it. And, 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 and we're, we're looking at the middle school, and we looked at, at Lincoln. That's why I'm just saying they need to look at that. That's a request. These are yeah. preliminary terms, but I think that's something we need to be aware of. Mayor County, just 
a quick comment. I'm uh, pleased that the developer uh, plans to use the low-income housing tax credits on this project. I think that's a 4% tax credit, so 4% um, programs. So I don't think we've had one of those in Des Moines for, for some time, so I'm encouraged about that uh, program and this project. So thank you. If, if I could just put my two cents in, I know it's not my ward, but I do stand with Joe feeling like he should have been notified. I mean, it is right across the street. We have local developers that do a really good job here. Um, I'm a little concerned about an out-of-state developer and what he'll do, and will he be here to manage it, and how will that work? I know that we're having issues right now with a couple other um, workforce housing uh, units that are managed by out of state out of state companies and that is that is an issue right they they intend to manage the property to continue to own it and to have a manager on site so yeah for 20 years and then they'll sell it after the tiff runs out in the tax abatement that's typically what they do council member Voss. sure I don't, think had, the problem, I don't think the problem that we're looking at is, is the first 10 or 15 years when, when the incentives are here. It's, it's gone way past that and looking to the future of 20, 30, 40 years and how sustainable it's going to be and what type of development it's going to be. Well, there are plenty of local developers and builders that sell their projects also. So. Right. I will point out as well that um, we are not the only incentive on this project. What you pointed out, uh, Councilmember Voss, uh, Iowa Finance Authority is also uh, providing the tax credit, which I believe goes beyond our um, time that we're providing uh, benefits, past the, our 17 years that we're providing benefits. It would go beyond that. So they might have requirements as well beyond ours to stay in. It's a $56 million project that after... 20 years, we're going to get maybe a million dollars worth of tax dollars. And we're going to get a lot of benefit to our economy as we're well by tax providing 60% AMI. And so I yeah, think it's I, a really I, important I didn't, project. I didn't even say anything about the AMI. I said a million dollars on a, on a building of $56 million. Well, the, the motion's on the table. We don't have to discuss it anymore. I think everyone knows where, where all of us stand up here. You want to look at the process, you can. Um, or we can continue to go down this road and have things thrown on the agenda and be surprises, and then we can have discussions like this at the table. Or we can get it taken care of before this. I just want to say, as an at-large person, I very rarely, I am just now being included in a lot of projects, so I just find out also. I know Carl and I have asked that we get updates. We're getting updates now, because when I first got on the council, everybody goes to the ward person. So we at-large were never included, so I appreciate this company at least reaching out and wanting to talk to us and go over the project. So. Just want to clarify some of that part of it. Typically, if it, the ward councilman would, would include the at-large council members. I know I have in the past with every development that I've done. So, I mean, that's, that's usually how it's worked in the almost nine years that I've sat here. Yeah. I really, mean, it, it really doesn't have to be a process. But it's, this, this, project, it this project was hide the ball. And everybody knows it. And that's okay, because you're going to get called out at the table if you hide the ball. Well, then so think. let's vote on it. I want to say before I vote on this, um, I absolutely agree. I think that it, it, it's an important project to house a lot of people. Uh, that um, could be families, could be students, could be people that, um, um, you know, are looking to be near our core and near some of these amenities. And, and I think uh, 216 units is a uh, rather large development, but there's some other large developments around that area. The thing that does uh, concern me is I also have received calls from the neighborhood. While I support the development and the concept, I do think that um, they should have been notified. 
um, and at least been able to look at it. Usually that would have happened in the past through the planning and zoning process. Uh, and uh, everybody would at least have gotten a look at it and uh, occasionally even gone out to the neighborhood and say, you know, here's this great thing we're going to do. It's going to be brick. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be a great opportunity and a great sighting. Um, but in this case, um, those people did not get notified. So even though it looks as though it's going to uh, pass, I'm going to vote no for that reason. Mr. Mayor, can I ask you, sorry, um, this, it wouldn't go through planning and zoning because it's not a rezoning process, right? And so essentially with this area zoned for multifamily development, it would be, the neighbors should be aware in general that that kind of a project would be put in this area. And so the need for notifi notification isn't built in for that purpose since it's not going through planning and zoning. True, but um, the there's a number of processes, either design review board or some of the others that often are, so at least the neighbors and the residents are not surprised that a development of this stature and size pops up right next door to them, um, and they didn't know it was going to happen. It, it, I mean, Mr. Mayor, just for clarification, this still has to go in front of Urban Design Review Board. That process right. is, no, is coming, so there is still public process that is part of this project. I understand. Typically it doesn't come. It probably come. should have happened before right. it came it, here. It, I think to the mayor's point, typically this doesn't come to us first. It goes to the neighborhoods, it goes to P&Z. The ward councilman usually, if it's going to come to us, includes all the neighbors and make sure everyone is okay with it. And we're not all getting emails on Thursday before the council meeting. Okay. That's typically let's, how let's, it works. Let's move ahead. Yes, please. Four yes, three no, motion passes. All right, this takes us now, we're going to have a brand new presentation. Uh, we're going to call it an informal hearing. And it's the authorization to proceed with the acquisition of the necessary property interest for the fire station for relocation project, council communication number 22-362. And I think I see a gentleman in the audience that's going to uh, make a quick review of the process. Hi, Mr. Mayor, members of council, John Kipp, Fire Chief in the City of Des Moines. Um, since this is, not to make a joke, but since this is an informal hearing, I'm using a bit of an informal presentation because my purpose really is to, to answer the questions that people have and tell the story about how we got here and give a visual of the, the new station uh, location. Previously, the City Council approved in the CIP a replacement of Station 4. Station 4 is currently at 9th and University. And so the action on the agenda tonight is to authorize City staff to begin the property acquisition process, which is really the first formal time that staff can talk specifically with property owners about gift negotiation or eminent domain regarding acquisition of the property. So. Uh, some of the questions that people have is, uh, how do we get here and what, what's the purpose of, of relocating the station? Well, the primary purpose of relocating this station is to enhance uh, the level of service in the north central portion of the city and specifically to eliminate what has developed into an inequity of that service. And so the area, um, well, before I say that, uh, the expectation for the level of service for the travel time from any fire station in Des Moines to um, are the responses that we go on is a four minute response time 90% of the time. Now clearly we don't have enough stations that you hit every, every inch of land in the city of Des Moines, but we try to do our best to plan that out. There is an area, there was an area in the northeast when uh, council authorized replacing or creating station 11 that we cut the travel time in half. That was the greatest inequity in service in the city. Um, next is before you, and I'm going to use this, uh, let's see if I can kind of lean a little bit and, and give you an outline of generally the area that we're talking about. At a point that's around, if you're familiar with the Chautauqua Park area, just north of there, if you were to follow the river to the north, up to, uh, up to ML King, roughly at Urbandale Avenue, and then you're going to come diagonally 
to the southwest to about 34th in Forest, and then back to the southeast to about 25th in University. That area sits between the fire station at 9th and University and the fire station at 4800 Douglas Avenue. And so there's, a, there's an area in there that does not meet that four minute response, that travel time, 90% of the time. And so station four also happens to be um, our second oldest a facility. It is aging as a facility. It is antiquated uh, programmatically as a facility for uh, eating, sleeping, exercising, um, control of exhaust from apparatus, how we clean our fire gear, those kinds of things. And so there's an opportunity when you do replace a station of this age uh, to make up those things. I won't tell the whole history, but one of the questions that I got was, did this inequity always exist? And it did not. If you go back to the uh, late 40s through the early 60s, a lot of things were happening in this part of town. One was a lot of homes were being built and the, fires, uh, the fire department was, was building along with them. They built the station at 9th and University, a station at 32nd and University, and a station at Beaver and Hickman, um, which you can just tell by looking at, if you're familiar with the map, that covers this area pretty well. At the same time, two other things were happening. We were building the I-235 through the city of Des Moines. We were developing the Merle Hay Mall. Um, and so 25 years later, our experience changes in our responses. Um, we lower the number of fire stations that we have, and so we displace them, we spread them out. Then you end up with the original station at 19th University. Station 5 then goes to 42nd in the freeway, and Station 9 is up by Merle Hay Mall. As technology improves and we study, we learn that there's an inequity. So now is the time to move that station. So where do you move the station, and what are the criteria for doing so? As we analyzed this part of town, we found that a point to start from was about 16th and Carpenter to figure out how do you, one, eliminate the inequity in service, and two, you don't give up uh, service someplace else. We're not trading uh, good service for less service. So we started and mapped many, many times locations uh, sprawling out from 16th and Carpenter. One of the things that we wanted to do uh, was to make sure that we covered that area that did not meet the four minute response time 90% of the time. We were looking for um, places that did that but had the least number of parcels, both residential and vacant, that, would be, that could be used um, for a fire station facility. And so what we ended up with was four primary sites that we wanted to look at. Th these are on the map and if you you look at the, I'll kind of I'll run through them really quickly. Across the street from Broadlawns Hospital, and Broadlawns is at 1801 Hickman. That's the furthest, furthest north. On either side of M.L. King at Lincoln, and between 19th and M.L. King at Clark Street. Obviously, if you're familiar with where our fire stations are, you know that this location at Broadlawns Hospital is the furthest from downtown. And so, while it did not have uh, the number of residential properties near it or that would be impacted, it would have uh, a negative impact on the western side of downtown's fire and EMS response. And it would really um, crank up the runs from station one in a way that would not be sustainable. It's too far away. It's a full mile north of the eventual site. Uh, one other consideration that for me, if you're familiar with uh, Hickman Road, when it goes to the east and it goes uh, down the hill during heavy rains, it floods there. And so that across from Broadlawn site um, became less and less tenable. It's not a great place to, it would cover that, that area of the map if the weather was always nice. Uh, kind of coming back to the, along the two properties that are on either side of ML King at Lincoln, those uh, also covered the map, but also would have a negative impact on the western end of downtown, and they impacted between five and 10 residential properties. One of them also had some infrastructure, some stormwater uh, and sewer uh, that would have caused additional, uh, just to, to make it happen. And so when we looked at between 19th and ML King at Clark, 
we found the location that did eliminate that inequitable area, did not give up service in the area of Ninth and University, or in the, the area to the, to the north, north of downtown there. And it impacted, I believe, two, two parcels that have resonances on them. Once I made the decision that that was the, um, that was the location based on the, on the data and those impact, uh, working with engineering and facilities, we did a, a briefing with um, ward and at-large council. Then we had a, uh, a virtual public meeting on May 26th, if I have the date right. Um, only, only one member of the public uh, attended that meeting, but it, but it led to a, a second virtual meeting uh, specifically with the King Irving Neighborhood Association, and that, and that, was, and that was better attended. And I, I really want to give some uh, cran, uh, credit to Ann Sobich Munson uh, for putting it together that way, because a lot of the questions that have happened between that second virtual meeting and today is the purpose of having those, those public meetings. And so some of the specific questions are, do you need to um, take all of the parcels that can be seen on a map? And I'm sure if I can, if I can scroll to show, essentially, hang on. Yep. Do you need to, how, how far north do you need to go? And the answer is, the minimum amount it takes to complete the fire station project. We don't want to go further than we have to. When we looked at this, we did recommend that this alleyway extend out to 19th Street so that it would not be a dead end, so that there would be an additional access. And some of the questions from residents have been, they don't, they don't believe that that's safe or necessary or should happen. So that's why we we're glad that the questions came up. And the disposition of that alleyway does not impact the fire station project. So if following your authorization to proceed with staff, the negotiations lead to um, either the extension, the dead end, or a hammerhead to allow a three-way turnaround, that's totally acceptable. And I haven't heard anybody say that that's not acceptable. Um, some of the questions that came up uh, um, had to do with the facility itself. and why is it pressing to, to move forward with this project? And those things have to do specifically with the enhancements that we had at Station 11. Um, cancer is a presumed uh, occupational illness for firefighters, and we did a lot incorporating science in how we get soot, carcinogens, and those kinds of things <coughs> off of firefighters and get them clean. How do we get them healthy? Uh, there's some things, uh, cardiovascular and otherwise, that we can do with how we wake people up, how we notify them when there's alarms, uh, things like that, that we'll, that we'll incorporate in uh, this facility here. Um, I'm trying to think of other questions that, that came up just today, and so I, I kind of want to ask the mayor and council, are there other questions that you have at this time? I know, I know there's members of the, of the public that will probably want to speak, and I want to make sure yep. they get heard. Um, Chief, the station that we built, 11. Yes. Are we going to build this the same exact size, or is the room that you have the report room? When we toured it, I thought that room was going to be smaller. So, is I know this is going to have a bigger another door on it, but is that room going to be smaller? Okay, so um, great question. Thank you. The concepts from Station Eleven are going to be used here, but there 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 is no design okay. at this point. So. Um, those things about that we learned from Station Eleven. Sure. I think the, the fitness, like the fitness area, for example, I think we hit it out of the park. The report room could that be smaller? Yes. The the non gender specific uh, bathroom shower areas are a great a great way to, to move forward. Um, one element that's not in Station Eleven that will be here will be a stairwell that's not used for burning, but we can use it for training um, from outside the building. You won't be able to see it because it'll be covered with brick. But that will enhance uh, the use of the building. Uh, something else that uh, I think worked well at Station 11 that we will have here is we, um, the training space in there is also a community space. So the neighborhoods, uh, associations around Station 11 can use independently mm -hmm. the, the uh, community space there. Um, I, think that's, I think that's something that would be a benefit to the, the neighborhood. I know there's interest in um, 
this project goes forward, incorporating things that are important to the neighbors in any way that we can in the project. I think that's a really healthy thing. We want to be good neighbors. Um, we want people to uh, come see us, and we want to be safe when we're interacting with them. Um, there are two kinds of interactions that people have asked about. One is the, the nature of fire apparatus getting out into the street and the neighbors getting out into the street, specifically 19th Street. Um, should The safety in one is not important over the safety of another. And my answer to the, those kinds of questions are, any driveway for a personal vehicle or a fire apparatus or an ambulance should be constructed in a way that people can enter traffic safely. Um, so if the alley was extended to 19th, there would need to be a lot of work done to make that even visible from 19th. It would be very dangerous. Um, if we were to face the fire station onto 19th, it would cause a real problem travel time-wise to go south. But we would have to acquire a lot more property in order to get those kinds of clearances. So those things are things that um, we're thinking about. Another question had to do with, what about, there's a school across, this, uh, across the way, is that, a, is, that a, is that risky to do that? And I don't believe that it is, because we've got two um, well-controlled intersections with lights. And if, if anybody's ever seen a fire apparatus uh, pull out of a station, we pull out, um, we get the doors closing, that's our opportunity to look left and right. It's, uh, I kind of walked through with Council Member Schumacher the, the different um, elements at the different stations, whether it's neighbors, schools, traffic, that are um, they're different variables, but it all has to do with what's the safety of pulling immediately out of that fire station. And I'm absolutely confident that um, it will be safe for us to pull out. It will also be safe um, to use those same walkways that are controlled for the kids at King Elementary to make their way over uh, for fire education at the fire station. So uh, I'm, I'm interested to know, um, you talked about the four minute response time, 90%, and you and I have had multiple conversations probably over the last nine years that, we've, we've, that I've sat here. Mm -hmm. Where else in the city is that happening? Because I guess I was never aware that this was part of the city and that's why we need to move this station to the direction where you're putting it. Where else in the city are we having those problems also? Uh, I can't give you a, a, a specific, but I can say that the, the Station 11 was to eliminate the worst. Yeah, I understand that. This is the second one. And the next look actually has to look in a whole new way at the central of downtown and south. Um, because we, we haven't studied. I would say if there's an area that's, that's next on that specific metric, it's about East 21st and Evergreen. And so um, right. the conversation about is it, is it because of the busyness of the apparatus there, the activity, the, just the human activity of being there? But that would be one other area. You can look to other areas that are very less densely populated. Um, sometimes people move out in the middle of nowhere because they want to be out in a little, bit, a little bit in the middle of nowhere. And so we have some of those. But it wouldn't be reasonable for me to say, let's build a station to cover all of that because we just don't have an extra. So as the, as the runs have increased each and every year, do you have any plans of adding a medic to every station as we go forward? Because uh, I believe every year, and I know this year, we're probably well over 1,000 calls than where we were last year mm -hmm. at the same time. And I'm, I'm sure you're well aware of that. So what is, what is the plans to address that as we move this farther from the core. I mean, I, I, and I asked you this this morning about station one, does this put more heat on station one? And then as we put more heat on station one, that draws from the rest of the city. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm concerned with, I mean, where, where's the breaking point as, as you see it, as far as the numbers keep going up? I mean, I, they're not, as long as I've sat, sat here, they have never gone down. They keep increasing, and we're on pace to, I mean, over 1,000 calls already in six months. That's, mm -hmm. that's a lot. Yeah, and actually the answer to your question is, is specifically why the council authorized the standards of cover studies, so that we can we go from first, where are the fixed facilities for the travel times? Then we determine how many of all the pieces that we need do we have the right number of engines, trucks, ambulances? My guess is it'll come back and say more. 
And it's from that that we come back to the council on how many people does it take to keep all those things in service. So um, that answer is what we've been working on since you authorized that this spring, and we're due, I think, in September to be done with a data-based answer okay. uh, versus the, the gut. Are, are we going to need more? It's, it's, it's going to be what pieces across that board do we need? Yeah, I would say probably more medics in, in stations that we don't have a medic. I, I mean, if, if I was to look at it as, as a layman looking at the number of calls, and they're mostly medic calls, correct? Those thousand, those thousand calls more. I, I would say that we're going to need medics where they're not, or two medics in some of the stations. I, I'm hoping that moving this further to the north doesn't cause Station 1 to be overwhelmed again. Because at, at one point in time when 4 and 6 were out of service, Station 1 was overwhelmed. And I, I, I mean, that's my only concern with moving this further to the north. But I mean, I, I'm, I'm trusting you that you have the data that shows that this is where it needs to go. Yes. And it's not going to overwhelm other stations and other units. Right. But that said, we are certainly, we, are, we, we certainly are growing by about 4 to 5 percent calls per year. So um, there will always be a time when I come back and say, these are the resources necessary to staff the units that we have and the numbers of them. And then it's up to the council to decide what to appropriate. I appreciate that. I haven't heard that from you in nine years. So, Joe, I think you'll be happy to hear that um, most of the questions I was asking Chief DeKip today were about the Broadlawns location and if that was a viable option as well as this one. And that's so much further north. And he basically gave me the reasons that he laid out today that it wasn't going to be viable partially because of that distance. Yeah. And that we didn't want to overwhelm Station 1. Yeah, that's, I understand that. Thank you. All right, Chief, anything else? That's all I got, sir. All right. Mayor, do we have a public hearing section on this? Public comment? That's why I'm asking. Yeah, I'm not sure. We could, I suppose, open it up and, and uh, give five minutes if there's some folks who would like to. I just want to see if there's any, any questions that people still have. Okay. Uh, let's, Chief, you may want to hang in case somebody uh, has a question, but let's open it up. It looks like we have a gentleman here that would like to speak. Give us your name, address, and. Question. I am Garland Armstrong at Ward 2, 3728 Hubble Avenue. This is for the chief, and I just want to make sure that if, when people where they are at, um, when, when you said the timing of it, to make sure that you don't have to travel like from, from that one station all the way to the other, and I know sometimes it's the traffic. Um, how do you make sure to have like a traffic light, like, you know, a signal traffic light saying that you're, that you're in a rush because you have a call and then there's no traffic light, like, you know, flashing signals saying that it's for the, for the fire, for the, for the fire trucks or the ambulance to make sure that they want to be there without getting distracted from the traffic. So how can they make sure about that situation? So, and then also the same thing too, especially when seniors or people with disabilities who are also going to be trapped in there, how will they be extremely well prepared for this? Because sometimes it's like, are they, are they going to make sure to be ready for it? Because we don't know, God forbid, down the road when seniors who are disabled and individuals with disabilities who might be in that same situation, but are they be extremely well prepared and tested for it? Because everyone's counting on them to, especially lives is most important about on the line and making sure to have the traffic light flashing so that they'll know that they're coming so cars won't try to, won't try to smash into it or something like that because they want to, they want to get there on schedule. All right, well, Chief, do you want to make a quick response to that? Actually, there's uh, probably two or three really good points in there. One of the benefits of this location is that it's near two traffic lights. And so it's a process called preemption in which we can control the lights. So when we come out and the lights turn red for the cross traffic, that allows us to go through safety, safely. Um, one of the things that you talked about was our ability to get to people where they are, especially if they're elderly and or, and or disabled in some manner. And one of the elements of this is to, to use that stairwell so we can practice not only providing uh, 
uh, dragging hose and those, those kinds of things, but how do we move people through hallways, especially in multifamily environments? And just generally, um, we, we train for all kinds of things, and so um, it's, it's kind of the, we respond on people's worst day to find a solution to make it better, and we will continue to do that. All right, thank you. Next question behind you. Mayor, just a clarification. You're coming down on MLK, right? Is that where you're, that's where the, or are you coming down on 19? Clark. Clark. You're coming down on Clark every time, and you're entering on? North on 19th, south on MLK. Right. So, so they can so shut both those off. And then they've got a light that will get preempted right there, and a light that will get preempted. All right, question. Here and go south. Up there and go north. Sharon Zanderzakis, Ward 3. I live in that area. I have a couple questions. On the uh, area that you're talking about placing this fire station, there's a couple homes there, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And those homes would be demolished? That's, yeah, well, that's the, that's the conversation be between staff and those homeowners because the action by the council is done. Sorry, we, we have to have all the conversation on the mic just so that it can be heard on the They'll recording. They'll be relocated, but correct. Sharon, did you have more questions? Because if you want to ask all your questions and then we can respond yeah. to them. And the other uh, issue that I kind of have with this is that everybody doesn't attend neighborhood associations. So how were people that are closely impacted by this, how were they or how were they notified? So I can talk about this a little bit as well. Um, I don't, Let's I don't, let the chief go ahead and answer, and then you can speak up, okay? Chief, go ahead. Well, uh, kind of second question first, uh, and this, this, is, this is available on the city's website. If you go to dsm.city, fire department, station, there's some Q&A and uh, frequently asked questions there. And the first public meeting, um, the 57 residents within 250 feet were, were sent a, a mail notification. Um, there was 11 uh, partner organizations in the area as well as Drake and the neighborhood associations is, is how the notice went out. It was not done uh, um, person to person. But on the first question, the council action tonight is to authorize staff to negotiate with property owners uh, to acquire their property by gift negotiation or the use of eminent domain. Um, so that's, that's a part of the process that leads to those homes. Um, there is, and I talked with Council Member Schumacher, um, you make earlier today, you know, there is some relocation assistance, but it's primarily the negotiation or the use of eminent domain to purchase those properties. Then they would be cleared in order for that site to be uh, properly available to construct the fire station. India? Um, I just wanted to add on, there was notification uh, sent out to the property owners who would be affected by this acquisition, um, uh, telling them that this, media, this uh, item was on our agenda, informing them, them of that. Um, I also personally went out and tried to reach out to who I could get contact with to talk about that, um, figure out you know, if they're going to be comfortable with that and discuss a little bit of that relocation benefit package that we have. Um, I was given a lot of information about relocation assistance, how it works, how the acquisition process works. Um, so due diligence has been done on this. Um, property owners have been notified. Um, and this, uh, as the chief said, gives us our kind of first way to officially um, reach out and have those conversations about uh, negotiations, relocation assistance, acquiring the, the properties. Um, so those conversations will be happening after this council agenda. Next question. Hello, Council. My name is Jason Zilk. I actually live on the block that the new fire station will be occurring on. Um, I would like to thank you for listening to some of the neighbors that have come. I also appreciate the notice that went out to the neighbors, and I see a few of them are here, and I'm very happy to see that they are here, including Amar, who doesn't speak English as his primary language and is very nervous to come up here and wanted me to walk up here with him, but um, hopefully I don't embarrass you by saying that. But again, I'm very glad to see you're here. I'm going to be very straight with you. I own two of the lots the city will want to acquire if you accept the resolution to relocate Fire Station 4. I spent, many, I spent several years making plans on how to unlock the overlooked potential of this space. My retirement plans were focused around transforming this space into something King Irving neighborhood 
in the city of Des Moines would be proud of. I was asked by a friend what offer from the city would make me happy. I reflected on this question and know that no offer would make me happy. What I would like to create is a situation where I get an offer that will not enrage me. An appraiser may come out and just see a lot. They do not see all the work put into that space before they show up. What is the city land really worth anyway? The last piece of land I bought from the city directly cost me $33.64 per square foot. A couple months ago, the city paid about $28,173 to a company that's outside of Des Moines, out, these are out of Cedar Rapids area, to demo Richard Prettyman's home, formerly located at 1915 Clark. That works out to a little bit over $13.54 per square foot invested in that lot. Would it be reasonable to consider adding an amendment to the resolution to authorize a minimum threshold amount of $14 a square foot to the administrative settlement? It may seem a little high if you are just looking at lots on a map, but I ask if this was your yard or your property, how much would it take to make you happy to have feet taken from you? If the mayor's home and lot were taken for eminent domain, $500,000 would not be adequate for just his home alone. The city wants to take two homes and one third of my block and it's budgeting 500,000 to do so. Where is the equity in that? I stopped by High B and checked the prices for a can of mixed nuts. And they were $12.99 a can. I'm only asking to be guaranteed a little bit more. I'm not even asking for premium price, a can of cashews cost $14.99. Please consider making this amendment. It may sound a little unusual, but I do not think it is nuts. Can, can I ask Jason a question? Jason, can you show me on the map where your properties are? On this map? Is it going to show if I point to it, or do you want me to use the yep, mouse? Yep, you can use point the to mouse. it. You can use the mouse. Well, because in the in the packet didn't it say there were eight property nine properties and eight property owners? Correct. I own two of the properties. Okay. Where where are they? I own the property right here just adjacent to the one that is owned by Habitat. Okay. And I own the property right here too. So basically exactly where the fire station is going is on my properties. Okay. It, Chief, I, I'm still really confused about the the path. So is is that going to be basically the front door right there where his, where where that is, or are you going out? I, I don't understand where you're going to exit and enter. The the arrows make no sense to me. If you're if, yeah, uh, I, I'm confused. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm using I'm using the map that showed the area the best. But remember, there's no design yet. So the red block is where the station is, but it will. The front big doors will open to Clark, and so you will always pull out to the south to Clark. And if you want to go north, you're going to go over to 19th Street at a con from a controlled light. And if you want to go south, you're going to go over to ML King controlled light and turn. Show, show me, uh, show me with the with okay. the with the uh, so, mouse, please. Yep. So I can you get just call, get my bearing straight. You get a call up uh, north into town. So that is the front door right yep. there. The yep. the and green it, arrow yep. made absolutely zero sense to me. Right. I'm sorry. And then you go up 19th. Okay. Road. Or uh, conversely, come down to Clark. You got to want to go south. You're going to go downtown. Yep. Come this okay. Way. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I I should have said that about. The I, I, I apologize so. because I just that was not. I kept asking Councilmember Mandelbaum, and I just get I didn't get it. And this would be taking a Habitat for Humanity home. Is that, empty it's an empty lot. Okay. Let's see that. Uh, thank you, Council. My name is LG Dupree Hansen. 
uh, former uh, vice president of King Irving Neighborhood Association. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Indri In Indria. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, for following up on my emails and also coming out to my house. I was at my job. I couldn't get to you and uh, I appreciate if we can follow up on that as well. Um, so the reason why I'm here is I own property at 1520 uh, 19th Street and that's that's the a, a lot of mine that uh, I could point it out on the map here. It's so my house is here. This is my I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. So this is okay. Now nice. this is my house right here. My lot is well. This is a different map. So this alley uh, is proposed to go through my lot at 1520 19th Street, and uh, I'm just here to basically uh, get basically put it on the proposal to dead end the alleyway because basically. Since the fire station is going in, the only way to enter, enter the alley is going south. Now, I've seen a lot on 19th Street. I've seen uh, cars speed on the, uh, of course, they use that as a thoroughfare, a thoroughfare. So speed is always an issue on 19th Street as well as MLK. Um, I've seen, you know, people, uh, they use the side, kids use the sidewalks. And so putting the alleyway entrance or exit on 19th Street is just as dangerous as firefighters en entering onto MLK or 19th. Um, so putting the ent entrance or exit right there, uh, it'd be just like pulling, like you say, you know, no one pulls out of their driveway all willy nilly. They have to watch for traffic currently on 19th Street. So, you know, no one's going to do that, but making an alleyway or entrance or exit, they might not be from the neighborhood. They might go out onto 19th and go up the wrong way. We've seen it constantly because if you're going to be traveling south up to 19th, if that's the only entrance up through the alleyway going forward, Basically, you're probably going to want to take a right on to 19th Street and continue your travel south instead of going left and actually going the correct way down to college. So um, that is a concern of mine. And also, I've just I've seen a lot of uh, just a lot, like I said, a lot of speed and a lot of uh, everything uh, on that block uh, since I've been there. I've been there roughly since 2003. And I'm just considering I'm, I'm hoping you consider it to a dead end alley or what they said, hammerhead, the alley, three-point three turn. Three point turn. Um, I'm, you know, I feel for everyone that's going to be losing their their homes, or the two people that are getting my neighbors that are going to lose their homes uh, to this. And um, that's my consideration to the the council tonight. So I thank you. So, Chief, can you explain to me what the alley he's talking about? We're gonna we're gonna create an alley on his property. There's already an alley, correct, right there on yeah. its property? So coming coming south down the middle of the block is an existing alley. Yeah. And so if we build a fire station here, it just ends. So the original concept was extend that alley over to 19th Street so you could still come out or in. Um, the, Mr. Hansen's concern was if a person's not familiar, um, they, they might make a wrong turn here or just in general, that 19th Street isn't a great one to pull out onto. And that's why I said earlier in my But comment, it'd be north of that house, right? His property is north of that house. Yeah, it's yeah, the yeah, lot his, right Yeah, up. I'm sorry. So we'll hear okay. then. Right, right there will be where you, you'll be able to go in and out of the alley right there? Well, that's, from, that's from what this action allows the city staff to talk with Mr. Hansen about is, um, he, clearly he just said he does not want that to be an access to the 19th, so the negotiation becomes... Should it be a dead end, or, or does he prefer the conversation? Could it be a, a hammerhead, which would be you know, like a little T-shape in order to allow a, a three-point turn? Whatever, those, whatever that disposition is does not impact the fire station project, and that's why you have city staff works with the specific property owner for that element to have that conversation. And everyone accesses their property from that alley that's on that. Uh, it looks like all their driveways and where all their garages or driveways access that alley. Is that what, is that what I'm seeing? Between that, that block has 10 residential driveways on it. I believe it's five on each side. From the alley? No, from 19th Street. Some oh. of the properties are also accessible okay. from the alleyway. But the concern uh, that Mr. Hansen just described was, He's concerned if you create a new opening onto 19th 
and it wasn't done right, or if a person was confused, it would be dangerous to pull onto 19th or take a wrong turn. And the alley would still be accessible from the north right. going south. And we need to keep the alley, even though everyone has access with driveways? The garages are Yeah, some garages are only accessible by the alley. Okay. So we need, we need some Hello, my name is Guadalupe Sanchez Andrews. I'm the owner for the, the house 1508. So it's the first one over here. Uh, over here is the first house that the, the city or the, the gentleman tried to throw it away. Um, I'm not happy for this because I'm living here for uh, 11 years. This house, I'm moving to Ankeny. I buy another one house in Ankeny and live in this house for my daughter and try to help her and living, um, make it for her the life more easy. She's got to college. And then she's walking to the drain. She no you um no need a car for um for her. Mm -hmm. She I'm trying to make it for her the life more easy and I'm trying to help. But uh, you guys try have a discipline. I appreciate. I appreciate because it's help for everybody. But but for me it's not good because my house is next to the fire station. So you guys I need Take her away my house. So when is supposed to go to my daughter? When is what what house I need buy it close to the Drake for her? For you guys it's easy for all her money. But not for us. Never come and, and talk to me. I come back last week over here and asking about all this project the city have and receiving the first note the first meeting supposed to have it this one is supposed to second meeting i never show up in the first meeting because nobody gave me to me information about this so for you guys it's more easy and come on and tell me like oh i give it to you what a hundred 150 for your house but you're never thinking about the families living over there Everybody's working, living over there for years, not for months, years. It's good. It's good to help the people for fire station, police station. It's good. But give it to us option for where's move with my daughter or the other one family because it's close to the school. For us, everybody's working. Cross the street is the school. All the children walking across the street or go to school. My daughter walking, how many streets? Like five? For go to college? I'm so poor that this <coughs> um, project that you have, guys, but please support us for where is move everything. Give me options. No, it's only like I'm coming and I'm putting over there and pay the house for the people living over there. But you, you guys never thinking about us. It's only your project. It's good money for you guys. I appreciate good money for the city, but not for us. You give it to me the money and go buy another one house. Yeah, but not close to, to the college. Because right now, when you look in the market, the house is so expensive. Mm. How much you give it to me? One house, single family for three rooms, close to the direct. All the direct is so expensive right now. The market is so expensive. No, stay quiet. Please give it to me options. Asking first the people living over there. It's hard for us to go looking for something else close to the college, close to the houses, because everybody has a different schedule for work. The school starts 7 30 to 8 o'clock. Some people live with the, the children already because they start working 6 30. And check it out, they go to school across the street. 
for us, try to make it easy for our children. But now what happened? So I need to change everything in my life because you guys have a very good project. But you're never asking about what is our points, where you like it. So you think it's easy for give me to me a one check? For go looking for another one house? Whether you guys know the market is so high right now? What kind of house am I? One room? Whether I have it right now, the one house for three rooms, parking for two cars. I'm using the alley for, for um, taking the out to my house because I'm never using it in the front. I don't have it out to the front. I'm using the alley all the time. All right, I think we... Ms. Sanchez, can I ask you a question? You said you um, are living in Ankeny or you're living in this house? My daughter living in this house. Your daughter is living I'm in this house. I'm giving it to her. Okay, your yes. so your daughter is living in this yes. house currently? Mm -hmm. Okay, so relocation benefits would still apply, is that correct? Do, you, do we know that offhand, if relocation benefits would apply in this situation? Yeah. Yeah? We think so. Okay. Um, so I, I'm really sorry that I wasn't able to see you earlier today when I went out. I, I really did want to talk to you. Um, the way that our relocation benefits work is that we look for, we look at the market and we look at um, what's comparable on the market. So it wouldn't just be, oh, your house isn't worth that much, so you're going to get a worse house. You can't get a worse house with our relocation benefits. So you're going to get a house that's either just as good as or slightly better, um, depending on a few yeah, factors. Yeah, but it's not that, that the better uh, neighborhood or a uh, better area. It's the problem is I'm making it easy for my daughter to go to yes. college. I don't know. Can we, um, do we incorporate that in relocation, um, talking about location like that? It's definitely going to be easier to have real estate here with all the federal yeah. rules because there's quite a bit of protection. All those these federal rules we're talking about is to protect the existing homeowners, to give them the benefit of the doubt at every step. Mm -hmm. And so I would really want them to be able to explain that fully. Okay. So when I'm finished over here, with who is the person that I need to talk to about this? I, I can talk to you um, yeah. after the meeting if that's okay with you. We yes. can talk about it and we can set up a maybe a meeting for later to talk with yep. real estate. Yeah, with okay. real estate. Thank yep. you. Okay. All right. I, I just wanted to, what I was going to say is from relocation, working with other relocation packages with the city, it has to be comparable. If, if your house is assessed at 200000 and to replace it is 300000 then that's what they have to do. So you are, are fairly compensated. If Mr. Zilk has a house and it has two lots and say you're on an acre, then they would have to replace it in price like an acreage home. Now he can move wherever he wants, but it has to be comparable i mean it has to be we can't go less than what he has right now so the price will really depend on on what you can find and again real estate will will work with them but i've never seen i've never seen any transaction with the city that has not been very fair really and you still have the right to go to the Polk county compensation board but this is, this is eminent domain works much differently than some of our other buyouts do. Yeah, I asked him because it was the first time. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. This, right. Do we have one more speaker back here? <coughs> Hi, everybody. I, I own the property in the corner on the, on the Martin Luther King and the Clark Avenue, Clark Street. And uh, I agree about what uh, Jason say. Like, I totally agree about what he say. And so that's my opinion. Thank you. All right. So we need to have uh, real estate um, get together with these folks and see where we go from there. Chief, appreciate your presentation. Council, any other yes. comments? Yes. Um, so I thank you so much. I asked the chief to come out and explain this because um, I had 
so many conversations um, about this project, about the acquisition process, about what the relocation benefits would be for people. Um, I had so many conversations about the location and, and why we're choosing this location um, that necessitated us to acquire two occupied households. Um, I had conversations with the chief today, two conversations with the chief today um, to ask some of these questions. And uh, so I asked him to come out and kind of explain what he had explained to me because um, I don't know that people had a full understanding of the, the entire process and how we got here. I don't think that um, everything was communicated and received in that, in that sort of way. And so um, we looked at that Broad Lawns location specifically um, over the, the Lincoln locations because they had so many property acquisitions. I asked about the Broad Lawns location. And um, with the inability to navigate around um, some areas, it just became not a viable location. It was so much further north. I didn't want to create um, a situation where there was a um, disparity in service further south, um, stressing fire station one, um, either of those outcomes. And uh, when this process started, the, the um, team who was looking at relocating the fire station uh, took that center point, looked at a, a bunch of different properties, um, decided whether or not they were viable, and came up with those four. And so we really only had the one option. Um, it, it wasn't so much a situation where it was decided and this is what we wanted to do when we just moved forward, but just that this was the one viable option that was going to take care of that gap in service. Um, I want to stress how much I do not take lightly um, authorizing eminent domain. Uh, I had so many conversations looking for a way not to do that, but at the same time, I also recognize that these benefits, the relocation benefits, don't come without this process. Um, I also learned that this is a process that comes down to us from the state and isn't really something that we can adjust um, or you know change um, in any kind of way. Uh, because that, that authority has been put in the hands of the state. Therefore, we can either do the voluntary process where there would be no relocation benefits and um, it would be a much, much longer process and much more stressful, or we can do this process where we are able to offer um, very generous packages of relocation benefits for people. Um, the, the lots that don't have houses on them, it would be fair market rate. Is that correct? Um, is, is We would be acquiring it fair market rate? Yes. So. Um, Everything should be as as fair as possible. Um, my email and my and my phone are open for anybody who is affected by this to talk to me during this process. If you don't feel like you're being treated fairly, um, but I looking at this process in so much depth, I think that this is our only option to make sure that we have um, fire we have fire service in the places that we need it at the service level that we need it. Um, and with the least amount of impact on uh, on property owners in the city. And uh, I regret that it has impact at all on anybody. Um, but again, I, I'm willing to talk with you after uh, about what those relocation benefits are. I'm not going to be the most informed. Obviously, real estate would be the most informed, but we can also set up those meetings. Um, would you like to uh, make yes. a motion? Yes. That is what I was about to do. And so with that, I will move item 55. I'll second it. Seven, yes. All right, the process has started and um, look forward to all those interested parties. Council member has uh, offered to, to meet with you and plus uh, meet with real estate and uh, see if we can't move this thing forward. All right, item 56 is amending section 102-964 of the municipal code regarding staff notice of street number addressing. Council communication number 22-375. Council, any comments? I'll move item 56 and pursue it to rule 42A. Um, I waive the second and third reading. Second. <clears throat> Seven, yes. Item 57 is amending the municipal code by repealing article seven of chapter 26 relating to steam or power operating equipment and elimination of the power engineers examining board council communication number 22-354 council 
I don't think I have it. I like it. I'll move item 57 in pursuit to 42A. No. Waive the readings. No. I talked to Cody about it. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Item seven, yes. Item fifty eight is the Oak Park Highland Park Tip District number four and repeal ordinance sixteen thousand one hundred and forty two. A is the final consideration of the ordinance above the waivers requested by Aaron Olson Douglas, the Development Services Director, and requires six votes. Council? I would move item 58 and 58A. Second that. 58A and 58 have been. Seven, yes. Moved. Item 59. It's review of the Zoning Board of Adjustment decision granting a variance from separation requirements to allow sales of alcohol, liquor, wine, and or beer by a restaurant and use an RX1 mixed use district for property at 1828 Hubble Avenue, which is owned by Javier Pleasant. Um, you are we are instructed to either choose alternative A, B, or C. Council communication number 22-356A is the City Council remands the decision and order to the Zoning Board of Adjustment for further study. The effective date of the Board's decision will be deferred for 30 days from the date of this remand. B. The City Council takes no action to review the decision and order, and the decision of the Board will become final on September 1st of 2022. C. City Council declines to remand the decision of the Zoning Board of Adjustment. The decision of the Board becomes final on this date. Council? Your Honor, I'll move uh, 59C. Okay. I'll second. And moved and seconded. 59C. Seven, yes. Item 6 is review of the Zoning Board of Adjustment decision granting a variance from separation requirement to allow sales of alcoholic liquor, wine, and or beer by a restaurant use in RX1 mixed use district for property at 1951 Indianola Avenue owned by Yui Lin choose alternative A, B, or C Council communication number 22-355 A the City Council remands the decision in the order to the Zoning Board of Adjustment for further study. The effective date of the Board's decision will be deferred for 30 days from the date of this remand. B, the City Council takes no action to review the decision in the order and the decision of the Board will become final on September 1 of 2022. Or C, the City Council declines to remand the decision to the Zoning Board of Adjustment the decision of the board becomes final on this date. Council? Your Honor, I'll move 60C. I'll second. 60C has been moved and seconded. Seven, yes. All right, that completes that portion of our agenda. It moves us now to our communications and reports. Uh, for those wishing to speak this evening, uh, under the public speaking item of the agenda, we will only be calling on those who have registered to speak. All speakers must comply with the rules regarding their names and addresses, or they will not be recognized to speak. Each of the six speakers this evening will receive up to two minutes each to make their comments. Please keep your own time because at the end of two minutes, the clerk will announce time and the speaker's mic will be closed and we will move immediately to the next speaker. We want to hear from our residents and we encourage residents to be respectful of others' viewpoints that may be different from their own. While you may certainly disagree with that viewpoint, I remind everyone 
uh, that the council's rules provide that any comment that are slanderous will result in the speaker being barred from further comment. As a presiding officer, I will determine uh, whether the comments are slanderous or not. Um, morning, arguing with a presiding officer about the determination on any matter is not permitted and doing so will be considered disruptive and result in the speaker being barred from further comments regarding. Um, I want to clarify for the record that um, um, we've had some discussion in the past about conflicts of interest uh, based on campaign contributions. Uh, so we asked our legal department for a legal opinion on the issue. Okay. That opinion was vetted and um, so hopefully we won't need to um, review that yet again. Our first speaker this evening is Jocelyn Hernandez. Jocelyn? Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jocelyn Hernandez. Um, our office is located on 4725 Rural Hay Road. Um, I'm the Senior Program Manager for the Refugee and Immigrant Vaccine Alliance. I'm here to uplift the voices and needs of immigrants, refugees, and underserved communities in the Des Moines area. Our members represent 18 organizations that have been and continue to be a centralized location for underserved communities to receive information, resources, assistance, and support about COVID-19, even though most of them do not get funded to do so. I would love to tell you the pandemic is over and that resources and information are available for everyone in an equitable manner at this point in the pandemic, but that is simply not the truth. Especially for refugees and immigrants, we continue to hear about vaccine hesitancy and misinformation. We continue to hear about individuals not returning to get their second dose or booster because they didn't have the assistance in their native language to make those follow-up appointments or because they didn't feel comfortable returning to a clinic where their culture was not represented. We are facing unique challenges to overcome the effects and consequences of this pandemic. Our members are often providing case management and support to those who have lost housing, employment, and family members. Again, even though they are not funded to do so. <laughs> Ethnic community-based organizations are crucial for the long-term success of families in Des Moines. They are trusted in our communities and play a key role in ending this pandemic. If I urge you to allocate ARPA funds in an equitable manner and help us bring needed support to our communities. So they are able to have the same chances as other members in our community do, do to succeed and live a fulfilling life. Thank you for your consideration. Adam Kellanan. Hello, my name is Adam Kellanan. I use he him pronouns and I live in Ward 3. I'm going to talk about a few matters that um, did not make the agenda tonight. First off, I wanted to talk about the need for virtual meetings. Um, as myself and others have reiterated in the past, we need virtual meetings. Public meetings can, should, and must be accessible to all. There are a lot of people who cannot attend in person, especially with the ongoing pandemic, um, and making meetings virtual, whether that is with a hybrid option um, or just fully virtual meetings, would open, meetings to, uh, would open those meetings to everybody for participation, and everybody deserves to have a spot and a voice in their city government. Um, regardless of um, anything else going on. Um, there's also been no public update on the virtual meetings, at least that I'm aware of, since around February. Um, I was led to believe that um, it was something the council had been working on and looking into back in February, and we're many months past that now um, without any significant update. Also wanted to talk about um, monkeypox. There's not really been an, uh, much update from the city. I'm nothing on the agenda about monkeypox in Iowa. There have been about 12 cases in Iowa, or at least 12 cases, um, according to numbers I could find. Fortunately, there are vaccines available. If you go to immunizepolk.com, I-M-M-U-N-I-Z-E-P-O-L-K.com, um, you can see if um, vaccines are available near you. I'm not sure what the eligibility is, but wanted to lift that up and let folks know that um, we should still be masking if we can. Um, it's an easy way to still help combat this ongoing pandemic so that we um, can continue trying to be as equitable as we can. Um, and further on COVID, um, it is still ripping through Iowa and most of the world. And there's been no significant COVID update other than the ARPA funds. And a lot of the ARPA funds are um, going to things that aren't at least directly related to COVID. 
Um, we're spending millions on things like parking and the Birdland Marina indirectly um, when we could be doing things to better invest in mitigation, such as uh, better air filtration for city buildings um, and, as mentioned earlier, virtual meetings. Thank you. Gene O'Donnell. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jean O'Donnell and I live in Ward 3. I am a member of the CCI Racial Justice Team. I would like to preface my statement with my appreciation for all of your individual commitments to making Des Moines a good place to live. And I also would like to express my appreciation for our police officers whose jobs can be difficult and dangerous. My comments here today are not an attack on anyone personally, but to continue to call attention to the fact that the way we do policing in this city is causing real harm to people, and that harm is disproportionately on our black and brown residents. Addressing the harms and their causes should be a priority for all of us. That is why we continue to ask for action relating to policing. An independent investigation of the culture of the police department that encourages these harms, a community review board where those who have been harmed can be in meaningful dialogue with the police department leadership, and then creating a plan with a timeline and a budget for instituting the public works recommendations. And then I would like to also echo the calls that other residents have made to address why we ask the police to solve problems that we should be addressing in other ways. Houselessness, lack of affordable housing, poverty, poor health, and failing infrastructure. All of us that benefit from the current way we do policing have some responsibility for the harm caused and for figuring out different ways of making our community safe, so don't put it all on our police officers. This work is based on building relationships, but we are being manipulated by a larger societal narrative that says we must fight each other for meager resources. Let's stop listening to that and instead truly listen to each other. That is what we are asking. Thank you. Chris Robinson. My name is Chris Robinson. I live in Ward 2. I'm a member of CCI. Um, I know I'm familiar to you. I've been coming here for a while now and come before the city council to, for better treatment of black and brown people in this city. But what you don't know, what motivates me and keeps me coming before and fighting for much needed change here in Des Moines. In 92, my brother, who was only 29 years old, served in the Gulf War and was murdered by a white supremacist. The man that murdered him, he only did two days in jail. Never did go to prison. He was let go. That's, a, that's what happens, though, when bigotry is running rapid and wild. My brother fought for this country, fighting in that war. The war didn't kill him. Uh, I was in the military, too. It didn't kill me. But there are people out here that would. Um, and so my brother was killed just because of the color of his skin. And for us to act like that just does not exist today, it still exists. It hasn't went nowhere, especially when you don't say nothing and you sit there on the sideline and you're quiet. So I stand here before you, like so many black men that have been stopped by biased policing. I stand for them. When I see misconduct by police officers who profile black and brown people, they are charged with sexual harassment of their own peers, caught taking down intellectual challenge people, and go on and never seem to be any real accountability. Inaction by some of you on this council only takes me back to my brother, whose voice has been silenced. 
We need a third party independent investigation of the Des Moines police to hopefully fix a system that has been long broken. We need a deep dive into the behaviors of some of our Des Moines police. We need to not move more on to our next policy changes in training, but real accountability. We need to move on to our next speaker. So every time you see me, every time you hear my voice, know that I am speaking for justice, not for our community, but for my brother. Jolene Prescott. Skip over me. Go to the next. Troy Trevino. Mr. Mayor, council members, my name is Troy Trevino. I live at 1502 Fraser Avenue, Des Moines. I'm the only remaining power engineer exam board member. Boilers are generally categorized as hot water, steam, low pressure, and high pressure. Let's talk about simple domestic household tankless water heaters, the kind you find in thousands of homes across America. These hot water heaters generate tremendous amount of energy. Like the ones found in my house, it produces 180,000 BTU. To put that in a scope, a stick of dynamite is 6,000 BTUs per hour. You do the math. My role is simple. As a, pro a proctor, um, I help proctor a test that helps educate and create understanding of the dangerous destructive powers equipment such as boilers can have in public and private sector. This type of board, uh, <laughs> this type of board is not, this type of board is not mirrored in every city, major city in America. In fact, not many cities have even heard of a program such as we have, but it doesn't mean they are right and we are wrong. In fact, I could argue shame on them for not having such a program. I do not have all the answers on how the Power Engineers Board should evolve, but it cl clearly needs overhauled. The test itself needs updating since the early 90s when DDC, Direct Digital Controls, became the operating control for most building automation systems. I feel that Brian Bishop, the Deputy City Council, the City Official, and his staff was onto something following one of the Minnesota's larger city blueprints for a similar program utilizing local community college systems for proctoring tests. This may not be the best answer, but one thing is for sure and cannot be disputed. The value of human life is immeasurable. I believe this program has saved countless lives and hopefully with the help of this city council will continue to do so as long as humanly possible. Thank you. John, I'll move up item 61, A through F, receiving five. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, we are receiving and filing all the information from our speakers. Uh, could we get a motion to adjourn? Been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposition? Hearing none, this means adjourn. We want to thank you all for attending.